Nata Pindika and the Goddess. In the time of the Buddha, his chief lay disciple was a wealthy merchant called Anatta Pindika. In the first year of his enlightenment, the Buddha and his monks were offered support by the brother-in-law of Anatta Pindika. When Anatta Pindika visited his brother-in-law and met the Buddha early one morning, the teacher perceived Anatta Pindika had accumulated merit that was ready to ripen and penetrate the Dharma. So he led him step by step and spoke to him about the benefits of giving and of virtue, of the defiling nature of the sensual pleasures, of the perils of vanity, and the benefits of renunciation. And then, when his mind was uplifted and ready, the teacher taught him the Four Noble Truths, of suffering, its cause, its cessation, and the path leading to cessation. Anatta Pindaka understood Whatever arises must cease and attain stream entry, the first stage of enlightenment. Thereafter, Anatta Pindaka used his vast wealth to create Jetavana Monastery in Jetta's Grove for the Buddha and his monks. His wealth allowed him to make the whole park a sanctuary for the training of the monks and novices. After many years, Anatta Pindika began to suffer losses to his wealth. He had lent much to local traders to help them with their enterprises, and in addition to that, a large store of his family treasure, hidden near a river bank, was swept away when the river flooded and the banks burst. But still, Anatta Pindika maintained his support for the Buddha and his congregation of monks even though he had been reduced to a state of poverty. So one day, when the Buddha asked him, Are arms to be provided today, householder? Anatta Pindakura replied, Yes, teacher, but the arms are naught but bird feed and sow gruel. The Buddha replied, Do not allow yourself to think thus, householder. If the intention is pure, it is impossible to give the Buddha and others food that is really coarse. So the teacher and his congregation entered the house of Anatta Pindika by way of a particular gate to the grounds. When they did so, there was a minor deity, a goddess, who lived above the entrance to the gate they chose, who could not withstand the radiance of their goodness when they came in, and had to depart from her dwelling place. She was highly indignant at this disturbance, and was blissfully ignorant of the fact that it was a living Buddha who had passed below her. She considered that it was no good thing for Anatta Pindaka to be associated with the Buddha, so she decided to detach him from this allegiance. When Anatta Pindaka was powerful and wealthy, she would not have dared to approach him in such a manner, but now he was reduced to poverty, she felt emboldened. So she appeared to him one night, suspended in the air above him, and pronounced the following. It is I, great treasurer, the goddess who resides over your fourth gate. I wish to admonish you. Very well. By all means, say what you wish to say, he replied. Once you were wealthy, but now your fortune is gone. Why do you persist in supporting the monk Gotama? Abandon your lavish giving, for if you do not, you will not be able to feed even yourself soon. Far better to go and devote yourself to your business alone. Make a new fortune and forget this monk. So this is the advice you would give me. Yes, it is, great treasurer. I would not be persuaded to change from my course were a hundred thousand like you determined to make me do so. You are misguided and wrong to say such a thing. Be gone. Leave this house. I hereby banish you. Now the goddess could not withstand the power of the words of a stream enterer, a noble one who had realised the path, so she fled the house, and fled her dwelling place above the fourth gate, taking her children with her. But though she scoured the city throughout the night, she could find nowhere else to lodge, so she thought to herself, I must secure a place to live for myself and my children. Nowhere else is available so I will return to the treasurer and ask his pardon. 
So she approached the guardian deity of the city and explained how she came to be without a home due to her offence and how she sought forgiveness. She said, As guardian of the city, I seek your help. Please come with me to this treasurer and plead on my behalf. But the guardian deity replied, You tried to separate a noble disciple from a living Buddha and said something you had no business to say. It is impossible for me to help you. So the goddess went to the realm of the four kings, but they too refused her request. Then she approached Sukha, the king of the gods in the world of the thirty-three. She repeated her story, saying, without a place to live, she would have to wander unprotected, children in hand. Sukha said he could not help her either, but he did know a way she could help herself. He told her to go to Anatta Pindika, disguised as his chief steward, and get from his own hand a list of all the treasure he had lost, the millions given in loans to help those in trade, and the millions more that had been washed away by the river bursting its banks. In addition to this, Sucker pointed to yet more millions, scattered in secret places throughout the land, which had long been forgotten and belonged to no one. When the goddess had found all this treasure, she should, through the power of her magic, place it in Anatapindaka's storehouses. So having completed these tasks, she was then to go to Anatapindaka and beg his pardon. And so this is what she did. She appeared before Anatapindaka and declared, Great treasurer, it is I the blind, stupid goddess who once dwelt over your fourth gate. Pardon me, my words, that I spoke in my blind stupidity. I have recovered your treasure and placed 540 millions into your empty storehouses. I have done so in order to atone for my offence. I have no place to lodge myself and my children, and therefore I am greatly wearied. Anata Pindika considered what she had said and asked her to accompany him to see the Buddha, and to tell him what she had done. She fell at the feet of the teacher and said, Reverend Sir, because of my ignorance, I did not understand the nature of your eminent merit, and so I uttered evil words. Pardon me for having uttered them. Thus did the goddess ask for pardon from the teacher and the great treasurer. Seeing that she now understood the nature of her offence, the Buddha pardoned her, as did the treasurer. And then the Buddha turned to both of them and spoke the following stanzas. Even an evildoer sees happiness, so long as their evil deed has not yet ripened. But when it bears fruit, then the evildoer sees the evil results. Even a good person sees evil, so long as their good deeds have not yet ripened. But as soon as their good deeds have ripened, and the good one sees the good results.